Welcome to Making Money Matter, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kerry Stevenson. I am delighted to have Rick Rule, investor and speculator, someone who knows more about commodities, but specifically about gold, which you and I all know that I love, and what's going on in the markets right now. So welcome, Rick. Great to see you. Always a pleasure. I need to correct you. I'm retired. It's just that uh, my definition of retirement is different than uh, that which seems to infect other people. Rick Rule, you're never going to properly retire because word on the street is that you're just about to open a bank. That is correct. I'm celebrating the retirement, my retirement the way other 70-year-olds should do, by founding a new bank, uh, my seventh de novo bank, and I'm having a really good time with it. Uh, as you know, Kerry, my mind either needs to be stimulated uh, or sedated, uh, and working is better for me than drinking. So here I am. <laughs> Why a bank? That's what I want to, you know, because you're known as, as I said just a, a moment ago, investor and speculator. That doesn't really translate into I'm going to open a bank. What was the rationale? Well, banking is certainly a form of investment uh, done yeah. right, uh, done poorly. Banking is a form of speculation. Uh, this will be the seventh bank I've been part of, uh, and I'm doing it because I'm backing a team that I backed beginning in 1998. We built a bank called Everbank, uh, eventually taking it public on the New York Stock Exchange, growing from zero to $28 billion in AUM, uh, taking the bank from a concept to a $2.6 billion sale. Uh, I'm doing it because I'm backing a wonderful group of people uh, that I've backed before successfully. And I'm doing it because uh, the competition in U.S. banking, while numerous, isn't always particularly efficient. Uh, as an example, the U.S. branch banking network uh, adds uh, about 110 basis points. Uh, and increasingly, the people who inhabit the branch banking network, which is to say the employees, while well-intentioned, don't know very much about bank products. <laughs> so that's certainly a problem that I see. I, I see companies, banks with a plethora of deposit products many of which don't pay interest. Uh, our bank will have a very simple high yield account that you can write checks on if you want, use as a savings account as you want, but we'll always pay in the top quartile of interest payers. This foolishness where you go to a so-called big bank and they don't pay you any money on your deposit mm -hmm. is true idiocy. Uh, we will not make the basic mistakes that banks like Silicon Valley made, uh, having long-term assets on the balance sheet for yield and funding them with short-term uh, overnight deposits. This mismatch between assets and liabilities it isn't something that is incumbent on banking. In other words, there's no requirement that you be stupid. <laughs> uh, two, in our market, many lending categories, which are really attractive to me, mining and oil and gas in particular, uh, are markets where the major banks are leaving the competition. So mm -hmm. markets that I understand are becoming capital constrained. Carrie, even an old, fat, bald, rich guy like me can win the 100-meter dash if I'm the only guy that shows up. <laughs> There's no major bank in the world that will lend against gold and silver bullion in segregated accounts. Now, I happen to think gold is pretty good collateral, and I'm looking forward to lending against it. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so Oh, wow. As you can see, my my competitive juices are aroused. Uh, banking is a business near and dear to my heart. I would best describe myself as a used money salesman. So I'm back in the same business. So what's this bank going to be called? And when are you going to be in business? It's going to be called Battle Bank, uh, Love as in battling for better, better banking or ba battling for your banking business. We regard ourselves as a fairly competitive lot. Uh, assuming that the... Uh, FDIC uh, moves forward at a reasonable pace. We should be open by the end of summer. We have effectively all of the technology uh, bought and paid for now. In other words, we're ready to open. We're just waiting for regulatory approval. Unlike our last bank, uh, Everbank, where we opened for business with no backlog of business, uh, at Battle Bank, we have almost 8,000 people who are on our wait list looking to do business with us before. We open our doors. Now, are you opening physical doors? Or are you opening online? No, ma'am. <laughs> no, ma'am. At Everbank, we ended up with, I think, we, we took over a failed bank at Everbank, and we ended up with five branches. 
and we basically tried to chain those branches shut. Um, <laughs> your phone will be our branch. <laughs> Does that mean this this could be global? In other words, I'm sitting here in Australia talking to you over there. Can I participate in Battle Bank? You will be actively encouraged to do that. We will, uh, as an example, if you were an Australian business person doing business in Australia and the United States, and you wanted a U.S. bank account that was interchangeable between Australian dollars and U.S. dollars, yeah, our answer would be yes. If you were an American person with family in Australia and wanted to maintain uh, Australian dollar-denominated certificates of deposit in the United States, the answer would be yes. If you were a Canadian citizen who was concerned about the fact that uh, mm -hmm. Prime Minister Trudeau f froze the accounts of political opponents, but you wanted to bank in U.S. dollars safe from Trudeau, we absolutely would open a Canadian dollar account for Canadians in the U.S. We look forward to doing every type of banking business that is simultaneously profitable, legal, and moral. I love the sound of it because it sounds like you potentially using technology to give a great customer experience. Because I know, Rick, you always talk about customer service. You know, you can have all the banks in the world, but if you give crappy customer service, people are going to go to the one that's, that's, that's giving good customer service. But I guess my question to you is, what are the challenges around getting Battle Bank underway? Because we now live in a massively heavily regulated world uh, I, I would say that's the challenge uh the challenge is that as bank regulation change the nature of the relationship between institution and customer increasingly becomes governed by government yes uh it becomes a check the box as opposed to service the customer environment yeah uh and, and i think that will be a challenge i have to say uh particularly with the uh office of the comptroller of currency and the federal reserve that my experience with the regulatory climate in the United States has been uh, surprisingly good, uh, particularly at the local level. The uh, employees of those institutions have shown themselves to me to be intelligent, uh, hardworking, and caring. Uh, at the top, those institutions are much more political and tougher to deal with. Mm -hmm. But I need to say that... Uh, uh, the experience I've had with the employees of the regulatory uh, uh, agencies has been surprisingly, surprisingly good. I, I think, too, that the nature of the customer relationships that the founders of the bank enjoy uh, will be beneficial. Uh, the uh, Agora Publishing Company and many of its editors uh, made up a third of the first round of funding for the bank. Oh. Uh, and they talk directly to 1.2 million paid subscribers around the world and 12 million other people around the world. Uh, they were responsible for a lot of the initial success uh, of EverBank, but they were never owners of EverBank. Uh, they enjoyed their experience with EverBank enough that they are becoming owners of EverBank. If you look at the fact that EverBank built itself up to become a $28 billion institution through direct interaction with customers, largely through social media. And you think about the fact that my former firm, Sprott Inc., built itself from zero to $25 billion in assets under management by the same channel, <laughs> which is to say communicating directly to customers through social media and building the bank with unique products that were, that were suited to the needs of the customers rather necess than necessarily the uh, needs of the institution, uh, I, I think you'll see a unique opportunity in Battle Bank. Uh, and I look forward to uh, causing that all to be real. Well, <clears throat> we it's 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 interesting. Um, as you said right at the start, you're 70, but you're never going to slow down. And here we are off on Battle Bank. But let's move, if we could, Rick, because I find that fascinating. And keep us um, up to date with that, because I think that with Battle Bank, you're saying we're going to be fair to the customer. That's what I was hearing in terms of- We're going of to be more than fair. We're going to earn. <laughs> we're going to earn our keep. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking, but, but speaking of earning our keep, one of the things you said was, was um, interest rates within the bank. Now, interest rates here in Australia, uh, I'm speaking to you two days after the Reserve Bank here in Australia raised interest rates for the 12th straight time. 
by another 0.25%. And, you know, last time we spoke, you said as interest rates continue to rise, we could become closer to a recession, in fact, possibly a depression. These interest rates don't seem to be um, uh, looking at the fact that it's hurting people at the moment. What's your view on where this is all heading? I have two views. I think the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Federal Reserve of the United States should get out of the should get out of the business of setting interest rates. Yeah. I think the market should set interest rates. The interest rate today seems high relative to the interest rate that existed three years ago, which was itself a manipulated interest rate. Mm -hmm. But artificially low interest rates represent the political manifestation of a war against savers by spenders. Spenders are more numerous than savers. And in a democracy, spenders wow. always vote <laughs> to penalize savers and benefit themselves. So from the first instance, I'd love to see the, uh, the Federal Reserve in both countries out of the business of setting interest rates. I must say I am delighted with the response of the American economy and the Australian economy, and in particular, the Australian property sector uh, surviving these higher interest rates. It lets you know uh, how much strength remains in the hands of private parties. Mm. Uh, the fact that we have been able to endure thus far the impact of uh, higher interest rates is, I think, really, really, really heartening. Now, history has shown, at least the history that we enjoyed, if that's the right phrase, in the 1970s, mm. that the impact of higher interest rates is delayed. Yeah. You, don't feel the, you don't feel them simultaneously because confidence continues to exist as a consequence of 40 years of benign interest rates. I'm not saying that we will be staggered later by a punch that we feel today. Uh, I am positively impressed by the strength of the economy, but I am still afraid of the impact of higher interest rates uh, in every sector of the economy, including the private sector of the economy. In economies like the United States at the federal level, where the last time we had dramatic interest rate rises, which was the 1970s, government debt was only 20% of GDP, yeah. uh, gives one cause for concern when on balance sheet government debt now is 110% of GDP. One wonders about the debt service capabilities of many individuals and many institutions. But I need to reiterate the fact that I'm amazed and pleasantly surprised by the resilience of the economy in the face of a higher cost of capital. But you also said that there's a lag effect. So I wonder whether or not that that, that the true that the truth will come out further down the <clears throat> down the road. And we all know that not that just a few days ago that the uh, the U.S. or President Biden uh, signed off on raising the debt ceiling. Uh, what is this? It raising the nation's debt limit, which is now at just over thirty one trillion dollars. And I love this, will ensure the government can keep borrowing to pay debt already <laughs> incurred. I mean, I read this, Rick, going, wow, it's, it's, it's like a cartoon. You know, it's interesting, and you describe it as a cartoon correctly. People are concerned about the debt ceiling, and they're not concerned about the debt. Yeah. Now, Carrie, let's say for fun that you took leave of your senses and went on a three-month bender. Maybe an attractive, pro, uh, maybe an attractive idea. If you exceeded your uh, credit limits and you called ANZ or whoever you bank with uh, and said, "I'd like to raise my debt ceiling," <laughs> I don't suspect you'd get a warm welcome. Uh, but if the bank and the borrower are the same, <laughs> which is the case with the government, all of this concern about the debt ceiling and no concern about the debt. That's what uh, I can't work out. A cartoon describes it perfectly. I suspect what it is, is that many citizens believe that they have the right to the benefit of the government, while at the same time wanting to deny the government's depredation on their own purse. Mm. <laughs> uh, that's all I can think of. Uh, to me, uh, the debt ceiling is complete theater. Uh, and the the issue, the whole issue is spending uh, and the expectation on the part of the citizenry that they're due services that are paid for by their fellows or 
more importantly, of course, by their children and grandchildren. Mm. And therein lies the massive issue. Rick, is there going to be a central bank digital currency come in which completely wipes this out and we start again? Now, Carrie, that really scares the hell out of me. Yeah, it scares the, the hell idea, out of me too. The idea of a central bank digital currency, uh, particularly if you combine it with artificial intelligence and social scoring the way the Chinese are doing, uh, with a central bank digital currency as opposed to with cash or better yet gold, uh, if they don't like the way you think and act, they can cancel your money. Yeah. Now, my government can get angry at me, but if they can't find me and I have a bunch of cash in my pocket, they can't do much to penalize me. But with a central bank digital currency, they could say Rick's money is no longer. <laughs> and you've seen some of my posts on uh, social media. <laughs> I'm afraid they might do just exactly that. Yeah. Anything that gives the government more control uh, over my own wealth, uh, my own behavior, uh, and the free interaction between members of society, I think is a very dangerous thing. I had hoped in my 20s that the advent of technology would give, pe would give people access to more freedom uh, and less reliance on government. But this central bank digital currency is probably the single scariest development in my lifetime. Is it going to be in our lifetime? Is it that close, do you think? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, this is going to sound make me sound like a complete uh, American ratchet head. The only thing that gives me cause for confidence is that there's 450 million guns in private circulation in the oh, United wow. States. Mm. And we have a history going back in time of if you push us too far, we push back. And my hope is that if the big thinkers think about the possible reaction of Americans when they've been pushed too far, that they will be encouraged to prudence, uh, if not by their faith in the American populace, then by the existence of 450 million means of self-protection. That's a kind of a scary thought, but it's something that I've I've thought about. And in fact, here in Australia, Rick, just... Just this week, uh, citizens in a suburb called Turak in Victoria, which is a very wealthy sub, uh, suburb, were all delivered a letter stating that, and I can't remember the group um, off the top of my head, but, but basically stating, you have a nice house. If you own any investment property, you need to give it away to those that are doing it tough. If you own more than... Um, more cars than you use you have to give those away it feels like social unrest is starting to come and this is the issue I think when you have that uh, disconnect and the middle class disappearing and it's not just here in Australia I think it's global what are your thoughts on that uh, my suspicion is that we have had a you know 15 year lurch to the left and we've had a 15-year lurch, too, away from common sense uh, into sort of woke speech. Mm. And my suspicion about that is, and I don't want to sound politically correct myself, but both the man and the woman on the street are beginning to think enough is enough. I hope so. This mm. is silly. Uh, I don't mind reading cartoons, but I'm sick of living in a cartoon. And I have no particular interest in having my family's future determined by a bunch of big thinkers who don't know how to define a woman, as an example, uh, or uh, people who believe that they have uh, the right to distribute your property as you, as opposed to they see fit. Yeah. Uh, and I'm actually very heartened. You know, I, I do a lot of mentoring of young people, as I think you know. Yes. Yeah. Uh, carry through organizations like Students for Liberty. I mentor uh, a, a group of minority ex offenders in the United States. And I need to say that probably in the last year, maybe my audience is self selecting, but basically every young person's group that I uh, talk to about these, these circumstances looks uh, at both me and the world in dismay and says that there's no part of common sense that's in evidence, either with the discussions that we're having as a society or the way that we govern our finances. 
and I see that as extremely, uh, extremely positive. In what uh, so way? I, what do you mean, extremely positive? That there. Well, like a, in the in, in the sense that for twenty years they've ignored this lurch mm -hmm. towards socialism. They've ignored this lurch towards woke public speech. And increasingly, the young people who the big thinkers purport to uh, represent in these struggles, the very young people that the struggles are suggested to benefit are saying, this is silly. Uh, this is insane. These proposals ignore common sense. So do you and, think and common find... sense is going to be coming back? That would I be do. I, I do. I don't think it's going to come back uh, in the near term. But I think that you're going to see a, a pendulum shift in response to the idiocy emanating from the big thinkers. It's an interesting time that we live in. We talked recession slash depression. Do you think, you know, we're going, you know, you talk about the left, you talk about the woke. Let's talk about the economy, the rising interest rate. Do you think last time we spoke, you said that we could be heading towards recession slash depression? It kind of, it's not being talked about, but it feels like we're already there. In my heart of hearts, uh, I think we're going to have a recession. I'm not an economist, uh, but I don't think that the rules of economics or the rules of cyclicality <laughs> have been ruled out. Uh, I think that beginning in 2022, that we've begun a very different epoch than the one that existed in the period 1982 to 2022. I think we had 40 years of benign economic climate. Okay. Uh, the consequence of that is that we enjoyed the benefits of workplace inclusion. Again, I don't want to sound too woke, <laughs> but I think that was a good thing. Yeah. We certainly enjoyed lower interest rates and we enjoyed an internationalism. We enjoyed the urbanization of 650 million Chinese yeah. as yeah. an example. Uh, I think that that period is over. Uh, I'm not saying that the world's going to go to hell in a handbasket, but certainly the period of declining real interest rates is over. Yep. Uh, I think increasingly the world is setting up into nationalistic economic blocks that will attempt to serve the self-interest of politicians inside these blocks rather than humankind as a whole. So I think that the climate is going to be less benign than it has been. And I also think that uh, recessions serve the purpose of reducing business confidence and reintroducing common sense. I think, too, that although this hasn't been a correct assumption in the last two years, that a rising cost of capital uh, will impact investing. And the rising cost of capital will devalue the value of income streams like dividends. Mm -hmm. So at the same time that the cost of capital through debt increases, uh, that uh, capitalized equities values through equity through uh, dividends goes down. Yep. Uh, I'm not trying to say that we're going to have a stock market crash. There is so much cash on the sidelines, oh. so much cash in private hands. That the stock market doesn't necessarily need to decline, but I think you might see some leadership shifts in the market, and you may consider you may continue to you may continue to see stock market declines. But I do believe, in my heart of hearts, that we're due for at least a slowdown in the general economy. That isn't to say that I've stopped investing. You know, a person who's a pessimist at age seventy does not start a bank. Uh, I think the future of humankind is wonderful. But I think there's probably a reckoning <laughs> between here and there. Uh, and certainly, if you look at the free cash balances in my personal account, you'll see that I've been overall playing defense uh, and building up fairly large cash balances. That's interesting, because I think you've also said recently that when it comes to recession slash depression, commodity prices will, as a result, decrease, which sounds to me like it's not a good time to be uh, getting in the market right now. Well, I, you know, I think in five and six year terms, uh, okay. it is entirely likely that a stock I buy today for, let's say, a, a speculative stock, a, a stock that I buy today for a buck, that I think is likely to be worth three or four bucks, 
goes to 60 or 80 cents first. It's happened dozens of times in my career, literally dozens of times in my career. And it's sort of, I don't mean to say it's irrelevant, but I look at two sides of the coin. I can see demand for commodities decreasing in the near term okay. uh, as a consequence of a recession. But if I look in the longer term, four to five years, demographics, 8 billion people on earth, urbanizing, increases demand. And I see supply inexorably declining. Uh, we have, uh, as a species, underinvested for 30 years in the productive capacity around a whole range of extractive commodities, uh, oh. copper as an example. You have a circumstance where the productive capacity, Christ carries as old as me, long, long past its prime. Uh, so I, I see a circumstance well, where, well, the near term is cloudy, uh, the longer term, and I'm not talking about 50 years from now, I'm talking about five years from now or six years from now, is stupendously bullish. Across uh, all commodities? Uh, not across all commodities, but certainly across the commodity complex. I also look at a, per at a circumstance personally where I liquidated my own portfolio of developed real estate. I'm not a real estate guy. Uh, and the consequence of that was I looked at the substantial gains that I had in my real estate portfolio. And I understood that those gains came about uh, as much as a consequence of lowering interest rates as anything else. Mm -hmm. With the interest rates going up, the uh, difference between my cost of capital and my return on capital employed was beginning to shrink at the same time as I believe that the capitalized value of those distributions uh, would go down. Uh, because other forms of income were available through higher interest rates. So I sold my own portfolio of uh, real estate and I haven't redeployed the capital. I've kept it in cash, mostly. Goodness, um, okay. On, on the resource side, I'm really, really attracted uh, by the fact that there isn't much segregation, particularly in the junior resource sector, between high quality assets and low quality assets. I think we're coming into a stock pickers market. I think too, that the mini boom that we have in, had in capital raisings, uh, both in the 2008 to 2011 timeframe, uh, and, and then again in the 2018, 19 and 2020 timeframe, uh, that, that part of it, which went in the ground is beginning to bear fruit. Now, I think we're coming into the beginnings of a new economic uh, of a new exploration cycle. Okay. I, I have noted in prior, prior cycles that it takes about a decade for the industry to employ new technology or, or go into uh, new places and get results. Uh, and we have been now in this mini exploration cycle for 10 or 12 years. And I'm beginning to see exploration results around the world that attract my attention. Uh -huh. So that makes me bullish. Well, speaking of what's attracting your attention, I know the last time I spoke, a number of people reached out to me and said, why didn't you ask him what he likes the, the look of at the moment and, and specific, any specific companies? Now, we have an audience that is all around the world, uh, sure. but a lot of them are based here in Australia. So... Is there anything in particular? I know back in the day, you loved Chalice that had the big PG discovery over in WA. You know, there's there's nothing, well, not nothing, but nickel sulfides I really like. Uh, I like the Chalice people. I like the look of that first drill hole. You know, it was a lot cheaper after it doubled <laughs> when you had the results of that drill hole to go by. You had some data. So I love that. Um and I'm going to answer the question, Carrie, but I'm going to disclaim it first. Um, I'm going to name a couple of names based on their potential. Yeah. But one thing that happens is if somebody listens to this interview a year and a half from now, and they don't take into account the news that's happened in the intervening year, <laughs> understand that everything I'm going to talk about now becomes data dependent. Yeah, that's really um, important. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. as well, this is not financial advice. Um, one right. of the things you must always do is do your own research. And by that, I mean, go and look at quarterly reports, go and talk to the management, go and understand fully where it is that you're putting your hard earned money. So this is Rick and I having a conversation. Obviously, Rick has been in this industry for a long time, but this is 
a disclaimer from me to say, we're not telling you that go out and sell your house and your children, but it's an interesting one that Rick's looking at at the moment. So just wanted to sure. put that out there, Rick. Yeah, I, th I think the new piece of Australian business, the new Australian junior that attracts me, not new to the Australian market, it's up nicely, but it's meteoric. Uh, I it, It's a little company that I think is going to either cost me half my money or make me 10 times my money. That's I'm that's attracted that's to the grade. I'm attracted to the people, but I'm fascinated by the geology. Okay, so let me stop you there for one second. First of all, the code is MEI. The ASX code is MEI. That's meteoric. And they're in Bra Brazil, I believe. That's correct. And, and it's a very large rare earth deposit. And by the way, rare earths are not rare, but that's another subject yes. we won't get into. But what is it that's, what's the what's attracting you? I think we need to say it's potentially a very large deposit. Uh, okay. I'm attracted to it because the indicated, indicated grade is high. I'm attracted to it too, because it would appear that it's a, a type of deposit that at least I have never seen before. It appears to be controlled in effect by volcanism, by a caldera. And it appears that the mineralizing event or events, multiple events, were profound. Uh, and it would appear to have the hallmarks of a very large and very controlled deposit. While it is in Brazil, Brazil has a long mining culture. As you say, rare earths aren't rare, but rare earths that are economic, decent grade and decent size outside of China, are rare indeed. Yeah. Um, now, everything that I'm saying is speculative. Uh, a lot of drilling and a lot of metal metallurgical work needs to be done. If that work proves up the thesis that I have with regards to the deposit, you're talking about a market capitalization in the billions, not in the millions. Wow. Uh, I love circumstances where a fairly small market cap is explained because of the unknowns, where I think that there's a strong possibility, if not a probability, uh, that the thesis uh, can be proven to be true over time. It will take, make no mistake, three or four or five years uh, for the value of this deposit to be understood by the market. Yeah. And lots could go wrong. If the things do go wrong, I think that they'll unfold slowly enough that rather than losing all my money, I'll lose half my money. <laughs> and Carrie, this will not be the first time I have lost half of my money on an exploration speculation. Yeah. But I think if I'm right, this adds a zero. Uh, and adding a zero is really what speculation is all about. So think about that. Just for fun, let's do the arithmetic. Let's say that there's a 60% chance that I lose half my money. Okay. And let's say there's a 40% chance that I make 10 times my money or 15 times my money. If you juxtapose the risk to the reward on an algorithmic basis, you would take that bet as many times as you could possibly get it. Of course. <laughs> if you could afford the loss of half your money, which I can. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. But I think also a lot of people, um, they they get a loss like that, Rick, and they then turn around and say, oh, that's it, I'm done. Not understanding that it kind of goes along with the territory in a way, especially in that sort of more speculative end of the market. You can make spectacular returns, but you have to be prepared for the losses. Carrie, in the first interview that you and I did, I don't know if you remember about it, for small for small cap, Yep. But we talked about a lesson that I learned in Australia, uh, and that lesson would have been learned in 1998, I think, at Diggers and Dealers in Kalgoorlie. Yep. I came upon a very strange, very bright, very hardworking guy named John Borshoff, uh, and he talked me into buying a, a bunch of shares of a uranium company when most folks couldn't spell uranium, called Paladin at 10 cents. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And I got a lesson. Uh, that stock went from 10 cents to one cent. I was facing a 90% loss. Now, if you're down 90% carry, you don't have a hold. You have a buy or you have a sell. <laughs> Those are your two choices. Yeah. Revisited by premise, um, gulped twice, bought more <laughs> stock, and watched that stock go from a penny to $10. 
uh, I, I'm not suggesting that the meteoric experience uh, will be um, that dramatic. I'm just suggesting that if you really are a speculator, you aren't playing for 20% wins or 30% wins. You're, pay, you're playing for 1,000% wins or 2,000% wins. And if you are playing for wins in that order of magnitude, first of all, you can't expect to garner them over a long weekend. They take four or five or six years. And secondly, they expose you to breathtaking risks. And yeah. you have to be prepared both financially and psychologically to take those risks. How important is the psychology of, of, of this rather than the financial? I mean, oh, oh, clearly financial is important, but the psychology of, of this, I think, is equally important. Before I retired from money management, third party money management, I had a couple, two very wealthy family offices as clients who could easily afford risk. But the psychological trauma around risk was such that I wouldn't let them do it. I just didn't want to hear them bitch. Uh, <laughs> I only I only allowed them into those investment opportunities where I wouldn't have to field their phone calls uh, when the simple inhale and exhale of equity markets caused them to be up 5% or down 6%. There are people, listen, if the essence of wealth is enhancing your sense of well-being and you're not financially attuned to either uh, volatility or risk, you should avoid it. Uh, yeah. There's no much, uh, there's not enough money to make to uh, accommodate you being uneasy with the process of making money. You're making money to feel better, not to feel worse. Yeah. So I think people do need to take themselves into account. Now, the, the truth is, by temperament, uh, partially, I'm a speculator. Yeah. Uh, I've, as I told you, Carrie, if, <laughs> if I lost half the money in this speculation, you know, it wouldn't be my maiden voyage. This is not, in American parlance, my first rodeo. Uh, and I've come to understand that losing money is the way that one makes money. I don't, I don't seek out loss. Yeah, but certainly I understand that it's part of the process, and I welcome that part of the process. Uh, Rick, we don't have a lot of time left, but I do want to ask you this. Um, uh, uh, this was a question that came up from our previous one. It's around uranium and and right. the new technology, uh, the thorium um, salt reactor breeder technology. Have you heard about this? And I guess I have. Uh, and, and I guess um, a quick view on on the uranium market. The uranium price has strengthened a little bit. It's gone over that. I think 56 US dollar a pound. Um, your former people, Sprott, they've they've got the Sprott uh, Uranium Trust um, that's buying up. So what's your thoughts? Are we are we gonna start to wake up and realize that uranium is a fantastic energy source? I'm hugely bullish about uranium. Uh, and I think that the beginning of the breakout year in uranium will be 2023, the year that we're in. Okay. Uh, I think that that will occur because uh, the Japanese nuclear industry is restarting. Mm -hmm. These aren't plants that need to be built. They're plants that are already be built. They need to be turned on. It is an inventory that needs to be bought. It's already owned. It's inventory that won't be sold. Uh, when you talk about a U.S. spot price at $56 uh, up from, depending on when you start, 20 or 50, you don't look at the real price in uranium because increasingly uranium transactions are taking place in the term market, in the contract market, which is opaque. And is it a premium to the spot market? Uh, I would suggest that if the spot market is at US 56, the real price in the uranium market that you're seeing today is 60 or 62. Right. Uh, and that's the made, that's the, the sort of magic point uh, at which the existing uranium producers go from losing money on an all-in basis to making money on an all-in basis. It's also the level at which the higher quality new deposits can be financed into production. It's the catalyst price, if you will. I suspect that the price of uranium goes much higher. I suspect that the price of uranium in real US dollar terms goes to at least $75, but that doesn't happen in 2023. With regards to thorium and with regards to uh, fusion, I think these are technologies that are valid technologies in 20 or 25 years. Right. The thorium question has been around the uranium business for 
at least 20 years. Thus far, Thorium has been efficacious for selling investment newsletters and nothing else. What? Uh, it has generated a lot of interest. But when you look at the uh, reactors that have been built, hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent on uranium technology. And almost nothing has been spent on thorium technology, which would suggest that so far, the um, technology is of use to academics and newsletter editors. Uh, my suspicion is that 20 or 25 years ago, years from now, pardon me, we will see the commercial application of thorium in reactors. I think the net present value of that information to the uranium industry is zero because yeah. cash flow that happens 25 years from now at any discount rate at all is worth nothing today. Um, what do you just uh, what do you look for when you're you're looking for companies? We we mentioned Meteoric and you know that's a you, you like that you mentioned nickel sulfide, you like those. We haven't talked about gold, um, but before we get on to gold, what do you look for when you're looking at a company? Is it management? Is it project? Is it both? Yes and yes. Uh, I don't look to be kind of right. I look to be real right. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not interested in small mines, even small high grade mines. If I'm going to take the risk inherent in exploration, I want to hit the ball in American parlance way out of the park if I hit it. Yeah. So I want in situ mineral values at today's prices in the U.S. $3 billion range as a minimum. In other words, I want a big target. I want a big deposit. And I want a management team that's been successful before. I have to pay a premium for that, and I'm willing to. Uh, success does not conformably align. <laughs> Uh, there are people who have had 10 successes, uh, but there are a whole bunch more people who haven't had any successes at all. So I, I want to invest with people who have been successful, and I want their success to be directly related to the task at hand. If somebody has made money for me, building, discovering and building gold deposits in Western Australia, and, and all of a sudden they're looking for lithium in Argentina, uh, those successes are very different. Uh, and I take a very jaundiced view. If by contrast, they've been successful building gold mines in Western Australia, and lo and behold, they want to build a gold mine in Western Australia, <laughs> I'm all ears. You're all ears. Okay. That's interesting because there's a, there's, there's a couple out there and you are coming to, uh, to present uh, at the Australian Gold Conference um, at the end of August. So um that's going to be exciting. We'll we'll talk about that in a moment. But what do you think is happening with gold? I I think right now confidence is high, and so I think that gold is struggling. Okay. Uh, for whatever reason, I'm not really sure what the reason is. Uh, maybe it's higher nominal interest rates, which means that more money is going, as an example, into U.S. Uh, treasuries. But when I look just a little bit longer term. Gold responds to confidence, and there's a lot around to be unconfident about in the near term, the most important of which is, of course, negative real interest rates. While money is flowing into short-term treasuries, we've talked about the arithmetic before. The benchmark U.S. Treasury is yielding, what, four? Yeah. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office suggests that the deterioration of the value of the U.S. dollar in real terms, purchasing terms, is about seven. seven. So they pay you four. In a currency where the purchasing power is declining by seven, meaning that you you, you lose three percent a year compounded. Yeah. If yeah. anything ought to diminish confidence, <laughs> it's the fact that the U.S. government absolutely positively guarantees to reduce your wealth by three percent a year compounded for ten years. The first promise, by the way, Carrie, that my government has made me that I believe that they will keep. <laughs> the uh, uh, another thing that would cause impartial observers concern, uh, and I'm talking about the U.S. dollar's comp competitor for gold price right now, is precisely the on-balance seat liabilities of the United States government. $32 billion. <laughs> trillion, I'm sorry. Trillion, I missed three zeros. Trillion. Yeah, I missed three zeros. Yeah. That's what happens when you get old. Uh, and then the off-balance sheet liabilities of the U.S. government, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, mm -hmm. another $100 trillion. It's insane. Uh, it is a truly insane. Uh, the increasing uh, central bank fondness for gold. My suspicion is yeah. that central bankers know they're broke and they assume all their peers are broke. 
Uh, and so they don't want to own each other's paper, particularly when that paper pays a negative real interest rate. <laughs> so they go into gold. And finally, gold's market share is ridiculously low. Uh, in the U.S., we've talked about this before. Yeah. Uh, the market share of precious metals and precious metals-related assets relative to other savings and investment assets is one half of 1%. It's ridiculous. The four-decade mean is 2%. Wow. Okay. Uh, so if negative real interest rates, debt and deficits, quantitative easing, which is really counterfeiting, uh, if all those things are enough to give one concern, gold doesn't need to win the war against the treasury. It doesn't need to win the war against the Australian dollar. It just needs to lose less badly. If all of those things merely propel gold's market share to the four decade mean, which is 2% up from half a percent, demand for precious metals quadruples. And that's precisely what I think happens over the next five years. I was going to ask for your uh, time frame on that one. So over yep. the next five years. Okay, yep. uh, Rick, let's finish it off. You've got a conference coming up in Boca Raton, Florida. I'm excited. Last time you, spoke, we, you and I spoke a year ago, I was excited then. And I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I went. It was fabulous. And uh, as Rick said at the beginning of the conference, this is unlike any other conference. Get your notebook out. Write a ton of notes. Rick. I found my notebook and it is literally absolutely jam-packed with notes I took from your conference. And the final comment goes to you, Rick, to tell people why you think they should turn up at Boca Raton. I'm going to be there. That's why you should turn up. Rick will be there. Yeah, that, that is why you should turn up. Uh, that is one reason why you should turn up. Uh, in truth, uh, if you are a, a natural resource investor, I think it's a conference like unlike any other in the world. First of all, it's been going on for 30 years. It stood the test of time. <laughs> we have great big picture thinkers, but not the kind of big pictures that you'd see big picture thinkers that you'd see on ABC in Australia or NBC in the US. The Jim Rickards of the world, the Nomi Princes of the world, the Grant Williams of the world, the Bill Bonners of the world, the Doug Casey's of the world. Great big picture thinkers, but not of the type that you would find in mainstream media. Two, you will have the finest natural resource analysts and portfolio managers in the world. Not people who learned to spell lithium three years ago, but rather people who have been in the business for three or four decades. Importantly, you will have the living legends. These are entrepreneurs who have built multi-billion dollar natural resource companies from scratch talking about how the lessons that they learned building million billion dollar companies have made them better investors and how they can make you a better investor too. Finally, at this conference, all of the exhibitors are owned in the accounts of the conference sponsors. Uh, at most conferences, the qualification to be an exhibitor is a pulse and a check that cashes in reverse order of importance. I'm not suggesting, sadly, Carrie, that every stock I goes up, that I own goes up, but I will tell you that the fact that we own every company that will be an exhibitor there, including Meteoric, uh, means that we have studied every one of them in enough detail that we are willing to invest our own money in them. Finally, uh, at this conference, if you attend either in person coming to Boca Raton or we're going to live stream the conference around the world, you will be able to review the conference proceedings for the balance of the year, meaning you won't have to absorb all of the information in July. You'll have access to it again and again and again, which you'll need. And finally, uh, if you pay to come to the conference, either live or virtually, and you don't think you got your money's worth, just email me. No questions asked. I'll give you your money back. We've done that for 30 years. We've had to refund less than one-tenth of 1% of the tuitions charged over 30 years. But if for any reason, including the fact that the conference is too advanced, in other words, even if we give you too much information and you think you didn't get your money's worth, I'll make it up to you. I'll give you your money back. Fantastic. Well, I'm hoping to see a lot more Aussies over there uh, this year. And as Rick said, everyone there, you know, he, he's got a, a, a vested interest in them. And I love the macro view as well. You learn so much. Dates of July 23 to 27, as I said before, in Boca Raton, Florida. What's not, like to, what's not to like about that 
Rick Rawl, it's been fantastic to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in July.